All right, thank you very much for being here. I can't believe it's raining. <laughs> Everybody see the weather report last year? I was so happy that it rained, sorry, last week. You know, it got all out of the way, so it's gonna be sunny all week long, and then maybe a little rain Monday, maybe a little Monday night, maybe some overnight. So I don't know what we're gonna do with lunch. It may be creative, but we can have lunch in here. Thanks, Deborah. okay. All right, so we're planning on having a lot of fun today. I'd like to acknowledge many, many people that made this happen over the last year, recruiting you, sending out flyers, talking to you. Uh, mostly, I would like to give the biggest shout out to Antonella Duhl in the back. Ah! She's so busted. <clears throat> Tirelessly putting up with endless details. She did a great job. And I'm not sure if I really have time to thank everybody. If you go to our website, you'll see we have this great uh, site of all about us, and we have this great group of internal advisors that have been meeting once a month ever since last year's Food Summit to come up with ideas like this. So this is the culmination of all those ideas. We've got Lauren Rosenberger, who just joined us a couple weeks ago. She's been working 100% time on this, just about. We have some great, generous sponsors that we're really proud of. So between the provost and the seven deans, we got $45,000 raised for this event, and 11th Hour Project, and Neutralite Health Foundation. So, and the Woods Institute, which doesn't quite fall under the deans. So great sponsorship for this. We'd like to thank Stanford Dining and Hospitality, and <clears throat> Darren Evans and his whole crew, and Angie, who helped us with the website. All right, so our program today is I get to give uh, a few welcoming remarks here followed by the Frances Moore LaPay. If you saw her, she's right in front. <laughs> then we're gonna have these great panel discussions. This is gonna be very different than last year. I don't know, how many of you were here last year, just out of curiosity? Thank you for coming again. Very different. Last year was talking heads, and this is gonna be interactive panel discussions. See how it goes. We're gonna take a networking break from 10 to 10.30. 10.30, 11.30, 11.30, 12.30. We're gonna have two different panels and an amazing lunch, which remains to be seen where it will be served. Um, in theory, we had tables all outside because it was gonna be so beautiful, but there's plenty of room in here. Okay, now for those networking opportunities for 10 to 10.30 or lunch, I have this idea, I had it last year. I don't know how many of you took, it, took me up on it last year. There's post-its on your tables. And so my idea is to put something provocative on a post-it you have to logistically figure out where the sticky glue is and put it backwards so it sticks off the bottom. Mine says, reforming NIH reductionist scientist, CBPR or wannabe. Anybody figure out what that is? I, I want to be a community-based participatory researcher, and I'm not. Unfortunately, historically, I'm a reductionist NIH-funded scientist. But I have seen the error of my ways, and I am shifting to a more community-based approach. So that, that's what this is all about. We've invited a lot of community activists today. So our objectives are gonna be to share some of the things we've done since last year, to continue to develop a learning community uh, across the disciplines on campus, and with those great innovators of you that are out there listening today. Uh, in the, after the lunch, there's actually some smaller groups that are gonna be meeting around specified topics, and they're gonna to try to generate the next set of topics to follow up on for Food 3 next year. So hopefully we'll have Food 3, and we'll tell you what great ideas got generated from two to four today. And of course, there's a great program tonight. I'll get to that at the end. So a little background here. Last year, this was a little bit of a hypothesis. Uh, we kept finding foodies all around campus, and we wondered, could it be true could there be foodies in all seven disciplines, all seven schools across campus? And there were. We found great speakers last year, for those of you who came, and they highlighted what they thought were big food problems, what the solutions would be, who else they needed on campus to resolve these, and, and some of these people remain connected. I thought we had a great program last year, and I'm not gonna go through all their names. Many of them are back today. But in fact, it worked. We got everybody here, we had great representation. I mean, the other hypothesis was, would they come? We think they will come if we hold it. And this place was packed last year like it is this year. We were sold out a few days before the thing last year and we're 
either sold out or close this year, even though we didn't charge anything. Okay, we're full. <clears throat> so this was one of my themes last year when I opened up. It just seemed like with all this intellectual power and all these different disciplines, it was almost like with great power comes great responsibility, but we shifted a little thinking with great resources comes great responsibility and opportunity. It seems like there's an amazing amount of opportunity on this campus to interact interact with the incredible Bay Area that we have going on here. So we talked about the intersection of human health and the health of the environment, how all this was coming together as a perfect storm. We've got obesity and food insecurity and food safety issues, climate change, animal rights, animal welfare, a lot of interesting things going on, very complex. It really, it really isn't any one discipline that's going to resolve this. So we all need each other, I think. But last year was very much focused on academics. In fact, we really did not actively uh, recruit the community to come into this at all. And so this Food Summit too is a direct follow-up to that. We actively sought out people, innovators, uh, leaders in the community, and they are all around you, and maybe they are you. So why did we even have this Food Summit too? Well, you may be shocked to know that even after last year's Food Summit, there are still a few challenges that remain. <laughs> Stunning though it may seem, all these talking heads up here did not simply walk away from the podium and all the challenges evaporated. No, in fact, they're still alive and well and uh, they still need to be addressed. So everybody should have a big collective sigh and gasp here. <sighs> it's overwhelming, isn't it? But it's not. I tell you what's not overwhelming is who is in this room today. You're going to hear about Full Circle Farm this morning, this amazing mecca of a place just 10 miles south down in Sunnyvale. You're going to hear about Deborah Dunn's class working in collaboration with Matt Roth. A team of design school students worked on uh, a program to reduce meat consumption in dining halls and tested it, and Ariana is going to tell you about her results today. And we've got, we've flown some people in from far and wide to talk about redefining hospital food. That's you, Frank. Sorry, you know, I just Googled that. It was on images. I should, probably should have asked you, but I don't know. I think it looks pretty good. I think it's a great picture. Okay, now those are some of the speakers. Now get ready for this, because if you look around you, you may not have noticed, I, known I was going to do this. Sorry, Amy, if you're here already, but I Google image several of the others of you. If you look around at your table, some of these people might be with you at your table. Veggie Lucian, Zenobia Barlow signed up to come today from Center for Eco Literacy. Bob Scowcroft, actually, don't think he's here yet. I think he said he'd come at 10, uh, from the Organic Farming Research Foundation, will be here today. Revolution Foods is here today. Do you see any of these people at your tables? Look around and see who's at your table. Jamie Smith from Santa Cruz City Schools. Jamie, I don't know if you arrived yet. I haven't met you yet. Anyway, this is all very exciting. And what this is all intended to lead to is to work with community groups doing innovative stuff, pair them up with researchers, and in the long term, think about building an, a new interdisciplinary program on campus that looks at these food challenges. Now, we've already got our first start. Heather and Willie, I don't know if you're here yet. Ah, there we go, over here. And Bruce and Lynn. So we've started uh, raising some funds that are going to ge generate pilot funding for pursuing some of these ideas. There's a couple other potentially generous donors in the audience that are going to continue to contribute to this. So we'll put some money behind some of these projects, which I think will move them forward. The things you're going to see today we did for free. Next year, we're going to have some funding behind it. Thank you very much to the Blackie Foundation family. Blackie Family Foundation. Now, I need to be careful not to step on any toes here. There really is food on campus already. The Food Security and Environment Group does some excellent work. Uh, and the Woods Institute does some of this too. But really, uh, Julie Kennedy did a nice job of positioning this for me. The FSC does mostly agricultural systems, and what we think we're talking about today may be more along the line of food systems. So we want to keep that great food logo that we got. We're going to brand that. That seems to be very popular, our logo. So we can do school food, hospital food, prison food, 
food bank food, food justice, foods in every one of those, right? So we get to keep using that cool logo no matter which one we do. So that's, that's pretty much what today is about, trying to connect with some of the leaders and innovators in our community and match them up. Okay, so a lot of folks are represented from many different disciplines here, and we hope you have an exciting day today. And for a very brief amount of time, because she's saving all her great, more of her great thoughts for tonight, I'm now going to introduce Francis Morlapé. Okay, Francis, brief introduction here. There's a longer one, but Deborah's going to use the longer one tonight, right, Deborah? Okay, so in 1987. Francis received the Right Livelihood Award, considered an alternative Nobel, for revealing the political and economic causes of world hunger and how citizens can help to remedy them. Her first book, Diet for a Small Planet, I'm guessing some of you brought those to get signed today. We'll have to see if Francis is willing. I'm pretty sure Wolfram did. Only if they're staying. Only if they're staying, I can assure you. <laughs> pretty much assure you their stains. Uh, that book sold three million copies and is considered the blueprint for eating with a small carbon footprint since long before the term was coined. She's the author of 18 books. She's the co-founder of three organizations, including Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, and more recently, the Small Planet Institute, a collaborative network for research and popular education seeking to bring democracy to life, which she leads with her daughter, Anna LePay, whose book we featured in our class this last year in Food and Society. Her most recent work, released by Nation Books in September 2011, is EcoMind. I've got to, I guess I'll ask you later to sign it, okay? Thanks. <laughs> Changing the way we think to create the world we want. In 2008, she received the James Beard Foundation Humanitarian of the Year Award for her lifelong impact on the way people all over the world think about food, nutrition, and agriculture. Francis, will you help us kick it off? Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. What a total joy. He picked me up at the airport last night with all that energy and it, it really uh, helped. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, I just want to compliment you first on the beautiful logo for this summit. Uh, so, um, I am delighted to be here, very, very happy to be here, because in part, very personally, this is a very special moment in my life. This fall is the 40th anniversary of Diet for a Small Planet. And thank you. It's a time, as you can imagine, of a lot of retro, you know, introspection, looking back, retrospection. But I have to tell you, just, I was telling this to Jesse Cool because it just seems so emblematic of my life path. I gave birth to Anna some decades ago, my daughter who I now work with. Soon after, I learned, we learned together that actually Anna in Sanskrit is food. <laughs> so, you know, and then she named her daughter Ida, and then we learned soon after that Ida is the Hindu goddess of food. And then this little Hindu goddess of food, I was babysitting this weekend, and she starts singing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. But when she gets to up above the sky so high, like a diner in the sky, <laughs> she thinks. So somehow this food thing is really imprinted in the LaPay women. Um, so uh, I am thrilled to be here on this uh, at any time, but especially meaningful right now. So I'm looking back, and okay. 40 years ago. This summit is, in a sense, for me, and there is so much going on now in the world around the power of food. So I'm looking back and realizing that, just take you back to Diet for Small Planets, first hitting the stands, and do you know that the National Cattlemen's Association actually set a team of cooks to prove that you could not eat this food? <laughs> And here we are, 40 years later, and we have Jesse Cool, we have Cool Cafe, Platt Street Cafe, we have so much uh, to prove them absolutely wrong, of course. Things have improved a lot since uh, the 1970s. I remember sitting with Alice Waters when we interviewed her for our book, Hope's Edge, and Alice was saying, you know, how wonderful it is and how, you know, we've gone from stir fries to what we have today, and I didn't have the nerve to admit to Alice Waters that I still love stir-fried vegetables over brown rice, but I do. Um, so some sense of the distance. 
Uh, 40 years ago, of course, most schoolyards, in which I have many scars on my knees to prove, were hard asphalt, and now I'm sure you Californians know that just in your state alone, there are 3,000 school gardens. 40 years ago, there were not enough farmers markets for USDA even to register, count them. And I think this is a true story. I'm still tracking down the details. And if any of you know this, tell me. But in the mid-70s, the, the, the way that I understand the explosion of farmers markets is in the mid-70s that there was an, a huge harvest of peaches that peach farm, peach orchard people couldn't sell. And so they wanted to sell them directly. But the regulations were that they couldn't do that, that it was against the law. So they dumped them on Jerry Brown's capital in, in I believe this was 76, on the yard of their, the grounds of the capital. And a year later, he passed legislation enabling farmers markets. And today, there are over 7,000, just in the last year alone, a 17% increase in farmers markets. 40 years ago, yes, organic, for me anyway, just brought up bad memories before you know, I began this process, bad memories of college chemistry. And today, it is, as you know, the fastest growing segment of our food system. And just in the last decade, organic acreage worldwide has tripled. 40 years ago, small farmers who still um, grow 70% of our food, uh, they were rarely heard. But today, the organization Via Campesina represents over 200 million small farmers around the world working for what they are calling food sovereignty. And today, the right to food is now enshrined in more than two dozen uh, constitutions. So, there is definitely a huge, huge change. Oh, I wanted to mention, Christopher encouraged me, on our website, um, when we were doing all this thinking of what the road that we've traveled, we came up with the idea of a food timeline that you can actually you know, scroll through. And so if you wanted to go to our website at some point, smallplanet.org, and if you, go to, if you click on the food environment tab of our website, you'll see it right there the food timeline, and you can scroll through and please tell us what we don't have on that timeline that you think is a big milestone and tell us why you think it is. And we had some of the luminaries in the food movement give us their, their ideas about what the milestones should be that we would put on that, on that timeline. So for me, the global food movement <laughs> uh, that I feel that we are all part of and it's so important to think in that big, big way is that its power is that it taps absolutely universal across cultures, needs and sensibilities. So I think of you know, the Hindu farmers in India who are now rejecting GMOs and re-embracing seed saving. I think of the farmers, of Muslim farmers in Niger who are pushing back the desert and I'll show you an image of that accomplishment tonight. I think of uh, American Christian farmers who are interpreting creation care as their call to sustainable farming. So the food movement has tremendous power. It has the power to shift our sense of self because the dominant paradigm tells us that we are just victims operating, uh, self-interested little egos operating in a market that operates on its own, doesn't really need us. That is what was captured in Ronald Reagan's phrase, the magic of the market. But the food movement awakens the sense that no, we are not just passive consumers, we are active co-creators, shaping a market according to our values, both through the rules that we're creating and the choices that we're making every day, whether it be to support a community-supported agriculture, purchase a fair trade product, or in, in terms of setting the rules, weighing in on 2012 Farm Bill. The food movement power, therefore, I believe, is connection itself, that corporatism, the dominant mental map, distances us from one another, from the earth, and even from our own bodies, tricking us to eat things that are actually destroying our bodies. So 
while the food movement does the opposite. It celebrates our reconnection at all of those levels. And just one memory I have of that very, um, very human connection. I was visiting uh, CSAs in Madison, Wisconsin a few years ago, and I was talking to Barb Perkins, one of the CSA farmers, and she said, Frankie, she said, you know, what pleases me so much about our lives now is not just that we're making it financially, but like it's what happened in town last week when I was shopping and this little kid, I saw him tugging on his mom's uh, purse and saying, mommy, mommy, look, there's our farmer. <laughs> and also reminded in that regard that my little step-grandson at three last um, Halloween, who has gone to our CSA with us every Saturday over the growing season, and he decided that he wanted to be a farmer for Halloween. <laughs> and he'd only seen a woman farmer to that point, so I thought that was really cool. So my sense, and this is a theme of EcoMind, my new book, is that, is that this movement encourages us to think like an ecosystem, and that is profound. It enables us to see our place for us, our place connected to all others at all times. And so we learn that in ecological systems, as my friend physicist Hans-Peter Dürer has put it, in ecological systems, there are no parts, there are only participants. And that is a very different way of seeing life. So with an eco-mind, we can let go of this productivist fra frame that keeps us producing, producing both more food and more hunger. And we can drop the premise of lack with the fear that that engenders is us, in us and embrace what I think of as a premise of possibility that is one that understands that once we align with nature, both human nature and nature itself, uh, then there's more than enough for all. So I'm saying that I'm so happy to be here celebrating, learning, moving forward with you because I believe that the food movement stirs and meets deep human need for connection, for power, and for fairness. And so let's not let anyone tell us that this is just a nice thing that we're doing. It is also powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's one heck of a way to kick this thing off. Thank you, Frankie. All right, so your next treat, before we have a stunning panel of different perspectives, is to share with you a project that originated last year at the Food Summit. A bunch of us in the afternoon got together, sat around the table. We called it Child Nutrition. We put a bunch of Post-its on the wall. The one that stuck out was vegetables. Some full circle farm folks were there. We said, how about vegetables at our farm? We said, great, what's the next thing? Summer camp, underutilized. OK, let's do summer camp. And all of a sudden, four undergraduates got thrown together. Right? You didn't know any of each other before this, right? Oh my god, this was the most amazing team of students. And I think you're going to have some fun telling you what they did. So our panelists, I guess you can wait till they're done, but panelists, get ready to come up they said it's about 10 minutes. I don't know how they're going to possibly do it in 10 minutes. But in roughly 10 minutes, panelists, please come join us. Hi, I'm Hannah Corman. I'm a master's student in Earth Systems. Actually, can we switch to our I'm Tim Deng. Um, I'm a junior in human biology. I'm Hannah Birch. I'm also a junior studying human biology. I'm John Proctor. <laughs> I'm a sophomore, and I'm interested in earth systems. So as Christopher said, this is a project that really originated in the Food Summit from last year in the Child Nutrition Breakout Group. Um, and it became a partnership between Christopher and Julie Kennedy from Earth Systems and the Haas Center and a group of six Earth System seniors who were looking for a meaningful project to do for their seminar. So we spent the entire winter quarter designing the week-long curriculum to take place at this farm. 
and a lot of thought goes into this curriculum. So we really had to narrow it down to two very specific goals. They were, one, to increase vegetable intake of the campers, and two, to improve preferences with the thought that by changing preferences, we could change their behaviors. So we had two methods in the curriculum design for reaching these goals. The first was dietary exposures, which really, quite simply, is putting vegetables in your mouth. And the second was garden-based education. So on dietary exposures, we really designed the curriculum to be able to facilitate as many opportunities for putting vegetables in your mouth as we could at the camp. So we had activities like a blind taste test, where a partner would feed you 10 different tastes of a vegetable, or veggie art dippers, where we'd use toothpicks and different shaped vegetables to make little models and then get to eat them. And they loved this. Um, and the second method was garden-based education, which is really hands-on learning in the garden. So this garden-based education really focused on four main themes. And they were environment, which could be learning about nutrient cycling and then playing a game, or learning about energy flow and then building a solar oven and cooking something in it. There was the theme of cooking, which really originated in the garden at the harvesting stage and then learning about cooking skills and cooking vocabulary and learning these easy and inexpensive recipes that the campers could take home. The third theme was health to inform the campers making, um, or to allow the campers to make informed choices. And the last theme that was really important was culture. We really celebrated the cultural importance of food. And each day at lunch, we'd prepare a dish from a different region of the world and we'd point to it on a map. And we made Mexican black bean tostadas and Ethiopian lentils. Another dish was Indian chana masala, and we made a pasta primavera, and we would really celebrate the different tastes and flavors and ingredients in these foods. So campers most widely reported that cooking had the biggest impact on them at camp, but designing food preparation into our curriculum didn't come without its own challenges. And we had several goals for the cooking process, which basically were to engage kids in that process. And to this end, we designed a lot of menus that included a wide variety of tasks, whether it was going into the herb garden and picking herbs, or dicing up a tomato, or sauteing onions. We really wanted to have these kids um, be invested in that cooking process. And another goal we had was to highlight the seasonality of vegetables at Full Circle Farm. And we wanted to create a bridge between garden-based education and dietary exposure. And this gave a lot of ownership to the kids because they were literally able to harvest something from the garden and then clean it and prepare it, cook it, and then eat it. But the biggest goal and challenge that we had was really to design appealing, vegetable-focused meals for kids. And we, as Hannah mentioned, we did a lot of um, new tastes with um, a lot of ethnic cuisines, but we also did a lot of rebranding. So something like a salad became a kale taco or a lettuce leaf burrito, and a spinach smoothie became a green slime smoothie. We weren't trying to hide the vegetables, but we really wanted to emphasize that this was about cooking and meal preparation. And this is a quote from one of our kids who said, so I didn't like squash, I hated it, and my mom made it with ravioli, she cubed it, and it's, I still hate it, but it was kind of good. <laughs> and to me, this really emphasizes the power of cooking and the idea that we, we know that we made an impact in these kids, even if they were a little reluctant to admit it. So an important thing to note about this quote is that the change in preference is initiated at camp but moves into the home with this camper as the mother was the one who prepared the squash. So this is the last really important part of our curriculum that we focused on because we knew that these changes couldn't take place in a vacuum at camp. They really, the lessons that we taught them really needed to follow these campers into the home to have a long-term impact. So we had a couple different methods of um, taking these lessons home. but. I also wanted to mention that the curriculum that we designed last year was not fixed. In fact, it was ever-changing, and we implemented the Agents of Change Challenge in the second week of camp. Um, it was an idea that we had to empower the campers to know that they could make change in their own home. So we would allow them to harvest a squash or a bunch of kale at the end of camp, and they'd take it home with the challenge to do something with it, whether it was share it with a sibling or cook it in some way and they would come back the next day and report back to us what they did with it um, so that they could feel empowered and also inspire their fellow campers. So now that we've shared a little bit of the camp's curriculum, we're gonna switch to some of the data collection techniques, the research side of the camp. Um, our 
primary data collection technique were the pre and post vegetable surveys from which we learned the campus's preference for a wide variety of vegetables. We also learned the campus's eating behaviors as well as which vegetables they were familiar with and which vegetables they had never tried before. Another data collection technique we had were the adventurous eater cards. The way these worked were each time a camper tried a vegetable, they did a little tally on these cards. These cards challenged the campers to eat as many vegetables as possible and really celebrated vegetables and adventurous eating as part of the camp. This allowed us to integrate data collection into the spirit of the camp and really merge the research and curriculum aspects of the camp. So how did the camp go? We had three one-week sessions of camp, which a total of 40 students attended. 36 of these students were on scholarships, and scholarships were determined by whether they were on free or reduced lunch. As we mentioned earlier, the goal of the camp was to increase vegetable consumption, and this was really a multifaceted goal. We wanted to increase vegetable consumption sorry, in terms of frequency, variety, and quantity. In terms of frequency, an average camper put a vegetable into their mouth 52 times over the course of the week. <laughs> Woo! That's over 10 exposures a day. In terms of variety, the average camper ate 20 different vegetables over the week. Out of those 20 different vegetables, five of the vegetables were completely new to the campers. They'd never tried them before. In terms of quantity, well, we don't really know. That was something that we struggled to quantify um, during the camp. We tried weighing the foods, we tried like watching them as they ate, but neither of those really seamlessly integrated the data collection into the camp. And this is something, so finding out how many portions of vegetables the camper ate, this is something that we really look forward to solving next year and finding an elegant solution for. So in addition to this quantitative data, we also wanted to get a sense of our impact on a more qualitative level. So due to the nature of community-based participatory research, which Christopher mentioned, that's what we were really attempting in this research project. And the nature of this kind of research is a partnership, and it has a very personal element. So we really wanted to collect some qualitative data to evaluate how we did on that kind of level. So we had four different data sources for our qualitative impact. We did a lot of journaling with the campers. So after lunch, we had them sit down, take a few minutes to, of self-reflection time, and write about their experiences that day. And we gave them some prompts to think about. So for example, on the day that we learned about biodiversity um, in a farm ecosystem and ecosystems around the world, one of our journal questions was, what does biodiversity mean to you and your community? We also frequently ask them about what tastes from lunch surprised them to try to get them thinking about these themes already. Another source of qualitative data were counselor observations. So we took a lot of notes about behavior patterns we noticed that the campers were demonstrating and camper quotes, different things that caught our attention. We conducted focus groups on the Fridays, so at the end of camp, which were similar periods of self-reflection for the campers, and also opportunities to give us some feedback. And as Hannah mentioned before, we also used our Agents of Change cards as qualitative data. So here are two pieces of raw qualitative data. The first quote is, I want to plant something here, so if I come here next year, I can say, I planted that, and that would make me happy. And the second quote is, when I go to the grocery store with my mom, instead of like putting cookies in the cart, like I want to put vegetables in. And so our process for qualitative data analysis was to first extract themes from these pieces of raw data. So for example, from the first quote, we would extract the theme of ownership of farming processes and a sense of satisfaction that that brought. And from the second quote, we would probably, or we extracted the theme of empowerment in healthy eating choices. And as Hannah was describing earlier, the theme of bringing something home and taking that into your own community. So we decided to visualize this kind of analysis in what is called a word cloud. So here's our word cloud. We reorganized our list of themes into three main 
subgroups. We have, oh, it's cut off. I'm so sorry about that. At the top, it says empowerment. So the green subgroup is empowerment. And then we have negative feedback. And in the blue, we have revelations. And font size indicates the number of reoccurrences for each theme. So you can see that positive response to new tastes was one of our most reoccurring themes with over 120 hits within our qualitative data pool. And similarly, as Tim mentioned, ownership of food preparation was also really impactful. So as Hannah mentioned earlier, um, Summer Camp at Full Circle Farm was a continuously evolving process. And the four of us wanted to leave the new generation of counselors something tangible that they could work with. So we developed a 70-page manual of procedures, which essentially in included every activity that we did at camp, how we ran that activity, and why we designed it the way we did. But we actually realized that this wasn't even enough. So we're proposing a student-initiated course for the spring, taught by the four of us, where we'll have the opportunity to go over more upstream factors and the theoretical basis for our research. We'll have the opportunity to go over uh, more abstract concepts like health and equities, but it'll also be a time for us to go over practical skills useful for running camp. So we'll talk about data collection and analysis, and really the logistics of how to supervise 20 11 to 14 year olds. And this is also a good point of transfer to the new generation of counselors, and it'll give them a sense of ownership because we're going to have them also design new parts of the camp and then implement them in the summer. And one goal that we really have for this course is to emphasize tenets of good community-based participatory research. This really was a collaboration with Full Circle Farm, and it was a mutually beneficial relationship. And our goal is to really uh, create a sustained partnership so that summer camp at Full Circle Farm can continue to improve and serve the community for many years to come. And lastly, there were just so many people who were involved in the design and implementation of this camp, so we wanted to recognize all of them, especially Ashley and Gina, who are in this room, our fellow counselors and educators from the camp. <laughs> but just thank you to all of you for your efforts and support. Okay, can we have all the panelists come up, please? Okay, what'd you think? I, I didn't do that at all. I just signed them up, and they just did all that. They worked with Julie and Ira and Ashley and Gina and Daniel and Wolfram and... Woo! They worked for uh, 10, 12-hour days sometimes, 100-degree weather sometime in the summer. I would come stop by the farm, and they'd say, thank you for the best summer job I ever had. And I looked at them like they had sunstroke or something because they, they had been working so many hours. Okay, now we're missing one guest who's going to join us soon. Okay, and that's my chair, so I don't really need that. Oh, what did I just do? Oh, that's some kind of level here. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk about Full Circle Farm. I can't remember what slides I did here. Okay, yeah, here's our panelist. So, uh, let me do a quick intro for each one of you. I'm going to have Julie start this off. She's, uh, she's not on the top of my list. Okay. It's okay. Just to make sure. Uh-oh. Well, I know she's in Earth Systems, and I get this so confused. So there's Earth and Environmental Science Systems. Yeah? Is that part right? Okay. And the School of Earth Sciences, but she does Earth Systems. Did I do that part right? Okay, and she's the uh, faculty director, co-director of the Haas Center, which provided one of the grants for John Proctor to work there over the course of the summer. And she led the course of the six students. Hannah was one of the six who put together that curriculum. It'd be kind of fun to start with you to, to hear what you think, what you thought when they showed up and said, hey, can we, can we do this for our senior project? You know, it's, it's an interesting question because when they, I run a class that is a, a capstone for seniors in a major, the Earth Systems Program, that's a very interdisciplinary environmental science major in which they also have to take into account economics, humanist perspectives, culture. Uh, they cannot avoid in thinking about environmental problems, social science and humanist uh, component pieces of those problems while largely earning a science degree. 
And in this capstone class, I want them to bring the best of what they've learned through the major to work in a small group setting on a, a project, usually a local project. And I give them two choices, that you can do something that is sort of a straight up research kind of question that must be interdisciplinary, but it can be very much research focused, or it can have a, a very strong service learning component piece. Service learning, for those of you who are, are um, not familiar with the lingo of community-based research and such, service learning is, is running a class in which you are trying to form a very active partnership with a community member where the faculty member has a goal for student learning. That goal is, is intimately connected to the goal that a community partner might have for a problem to investigate and, and possible solutions to, to some challenge in front of us, and the goal for student learning. And every time that I teach this class that I put out that, that service learning goal, Every group heretofore has wanted to focus on local food issues, which I find absolutely fascinating. And so I wasn't surprised that one group, uh, strongly led by Hannah, said, you know, I have this great opportunity and we could do this. Students from across our track areas, the six students who came together to work on this, uh, represented those who had deep focus in energy, in thinking about the biosphere, in thinking about land systems and land management, thinking about oceans and ocean health, they really represented the, the depth and breadth of what it means to study the environment. When they came and told me two important pieces of information, Christopher, that they would be working with you, which was a really good sign, but that the focus was very much more what I would think of as the purview of, of our fabulous human biology program here. Um, yes, it is great. <laughs> human health, nutrition. And so we had to do a lot of exploration of what, what is going to be, what are my learning goals for you? And can we meet that in the course of you focusing on this direction? What are the learning goals for, for you and for Full Circle Farm as our community partners? What will the students get out of this? And I think, and then this class creates, which is also intimately connection to serve, connected to service learning, an opportunity for reflection for the students afterwards. They gave an absolutely fantastic, superb presentation at the end of the quarter on the curriculum that, that Hannah then went on with her colleagues to, to teach so beautifully. So the solution that we came to throughout the course of the quarter, the two of us meeting periodically, meeting with the whole group, me meeting with the group every week, was that along with thinking about human health, you really can't be separating that from thinking about the biophysical system that is creating the food that leads to a healthy lifestyle. You must be thinking about soils. You must be thinking about the very cool bugs that are doing the pollination and the degradation for us and turning compost into soil. You really, it's a neat system. It is a fun system. It is a system that's wonderful to know at a fairly advanced level when, when you are thinking of it from the point of view of a biogeochemist. It is maybe even more fun and wondrous from the point of view of a kid to think that, you know, geez, worms did this for me. That's really cool. And, and so to build the best of that sense of fun and playfulness and exploration in with their deep understanding of, you know, whether it is thinking about pollinators, whether it is thinking about energy, or if you eat in an extra local food shed, what's the carbon cost of that? And can you actually help students little kids to calculate that carbon cost. They did that. They figured out how to integrate all of that in a way that was seamless. And I just thought it was a very elegant product. So I was very proud of them. Nice job. And you seem to wear the two perfect hats for this, being yes. from Haas and Earth Systems. So is this just chance that they ended up in your class, or is this all because of you? <laughs> Ask Hannah. <laughs> Hannah, how did that happen? I think we just have a lot of students at Stanford Earth system certainly represents a community of them, but there are many, such as human biology, which has got, what, Catherine, 400 or more students in it. A lot of students who love, they can't help themselves. They need to think about complex problems in a very integrative way. They're, they're not the single discipline burrow in. They must see a problem in a very whole, three-dimensional kind of way and find multiple paths toward analysis of, of problems in, in that field area. And applied, so you mentioned when we talked earlier that, that one group did a project with Glide Memorial oh. Church in San Francisco and Collective Roots in East Palo Alto yes. and food 
so was the, so practical for the, being applied. The Glide project was wonderful. It, um, working with the woman who runs their rooftop gardens program, the, the question that she posed, since she basically runs the program by herself, was, you know, like, what can I do? Yes, we'd love to expand this. There's a nearby lot that's been behind fences by the city forever. It's a blighted lot, but it is privately owned. And so my students took on working with her as their community partner, uh, uh, creating a, a, a prescription, if you will, for the different ways legally or somewhat creatively that, that Glide might use, that there are other examples of in San Francisco for acquiring these lands, whether this would be through going through the city through eminent domain, whether this would be on the other end of the spectrum through guerrilla gardening, go ahead and take it and do it and then ask permission later, whether there were opportunities in there to work with the owners of the land and have them either lease it from them or, or have them donate the land and take it off taxes. So they really did a thorough investigation on all of those. And then from the starting point of having acquired the land, they did an analysis of the different economic and business models that Glide might use depending on what their ultimate goal was. So to think about that goal is the goal to feed local people? Is the goal to train people how to grow food on this land? Is the goal to raise money on this land? So should you, should you intercrop in a really creative way and go for maximum yield to feed people from this land? Should you maybe grow a lot of specialty crops that you could sell at a farmer's market or through a CSA and therefore earn even more money that could go back to feed more people? Do you want to use it for education? And so not favoring any of those, but laying out a lot of models so, so they could give to Glide. You may not be able to act on this right away, but when you are, here is a nice prescription for how to move forward. And similarly, the collective roots work was focused on a, a, a similar conjunction with the business model. Why aren't there more sort of high-tech, green-tech jobs that speak to agriculture? There's a lot of ways out there that we could be training people that aren't just um, you know, sort of back-breaking labor that are that speak to creative business models you know the partnerships that people have with growing mushrooms and sprouts that move straight from a small plot of land to specialty restaurants nearby and the idea there being that there's a lot of money that is generated so what do some of those different models look like how might collective roots start to engage in some of those models to earn more money and do more green job training in the ag sector so really fun stuff that's great. And these places aren't automatically successful. All these places need some help with impact assessment or improvement. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, so you get your Earth Systems hat and as a Haas director and Jeff Hawthorne's in the audience, you guys have, uh, what I heard from Virginia, who has moved on, now I'm blanking mm -hmm. on her last name, was that a really common theme in Haas has been food for these summer internships. I mean, you've sent people across yeah. the country, I, I can't remember what states, but they left town, they left campus, mm -hmm. and it was food. Yep. Food was really practical and really energizing. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to keep moving along in our mm -hmm. panel here. I'm going to call on Ira next because Ira was a speaker last year, did this phenomenal talk from the School of Education. He's the Associate Director of the STEP Elementary Program, and I had the honor of going to Jesse Cool's house. I missed you that day. I, you didn't come that one day that I finally showed up. But you've got some uh, students getting their master's degree and you've incorporated a garden curriculum into it. And that's kind of how I first met you. Can you start out telling me how food ended up in that step curriculum? Uh, sure. Um, first, I want to thank you for, um, for this particular setup. I think having the faculty speak after the students is appropriately humbling, uh, puts us uh, properly in our place. Uh, and um, I want to acknowledge the accomplishments that the students have made. Uh, if we think back a year ago when um, the meeting that they were discussing, the two of us were essentially leading what could only be described as a fairly disorganized conversation. Um, and from that, the students managed to accomplish an incredible amount over a, a course of 12 months, really less than 12 months because they finished their accomplishments uh -huh. over the summer. Uh, it makes me wonder what it is that I did over that nine month period. Um, anyway, I really wanted to acknowledge the hard work. I was able to spend time, uh, a little bit of time with the students over the year, and um, the, the audaciousness of their vision, um, really what they wanted to do was to build a school um, in an alternative school, outside of a regular context, uh, in a garden, uh, and bring to life a part of the curriculum that's very well underserved and underutilized by our typical uh, traditional school model 
um, is incredibly bold, the kind of thing that you know, uh, you know, mid-career faculty member would likely not undertake for a variety of reasons. Um, and maybe partly because you didn't realize how challenging it would be, you managed to um, find the resources that you needed and accomplish really more than I think most of us would have imagined you could do in that short period of time. So I really want to, uh, my hat goes off to you and I, I think that the work is yeah. horrendous. So I think your, your question is kind of, um, you know, who am I and why am I here? So uh, I really <laughs> want to acknowledge the, um, what brought me uh, here uh, to this uh, particular piece of work are several colleagues who I think were visionary in a lot of ways. So uh, my colleague Ruth Ann Costanzo, who um, is the Director of Clinical Work for Stanford's Teacher Education Program, and my friend and colleague Jesse Kuhl, um, uh, chef and food enthusiast extraordinaire. Um, had a vision seven years ago when we were developing an elementary teacher education program in the School of Education. Um, and they had the notion that we should be thinking about the curriculum we design and build into our program very broadly um, so that uh, ideally as a demonstration program we would be reflecting that broad uh, curriculum uh, to the wider world. Um, Jesse was kind enough to let us explore opportunities to utilize um, her local garden that she's uh, developed in her backyard uh, to open her house and her kitchen to our students. And over the course of a seven year period, we have put together um, what I modestly would say is a really thoughtful, um, integrated, engaged curriculum where we um, expose our uh, teacher candidates to the notion of how to um, work with their own young children to think about um, health, food, nutrition uh, from seed to table. And we really explore all those elements right in Jesse's backyard. So uh, every quarter we go and we explore what's happening in the garden. Uh, we work with Drew Harwell, um, a local gardener, master gardener, and he talks to us about um, how food grows, what it is that we need to know, and how we make those translations to elementary school curriculum. Uh, we harvest food out of the garden, we take it to Jesse's kitchen and we prepare it. And again, with uh, the mindset of how can we do the same thing with elementary school children. So we have very simple um, recipe curriculum that Jesse has put together over, over the course of years. Uh, then we also work to think about the ways that we make connections to the state and national curriculum standards and framework so that this kind of work can find a suitable home uh, in the traditional schools as they currently exist. Uh, and then really the highlight for us is the work that our students and then the graduates do uh, in their own classrooms with their own students. So um, that's kind of the cycle of the work that we do together. And really it's, um, uh, it's a product of the vision that Jesse and Ruth Ann had seven years ago. And um, as I like to say, they're the seeds and the flower and I, I, I get to be the compost. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And we may take advantage of some of those students. So we worked Ashley to the bone in adding our program on top of what she already had before. And at the end of the camp this summer, Ashley had a great suggestion. She said, you know, maybe we could have an education director just for the summer camp next year. So we've actually approached Ira, written a job description. Well, from welcome, sorry about traffic. Uh, and so we're gonna try to advertise in your group for a, summer te for a teacher who wants a summer income right, to potentially be. So what do you think about that as an opportunity? Do you think we'll have any trouble filling that role among all the students you have go through your program? Well, two thoughts. One is, um, uh, uh, in spite of the incredible accomplishments of this really talented group of undergraduates and uh, even just the fact that they're thinking about designing a course uh, to make this project more sustainable is tremendous. Uh, at the same time, running a school on a regular basis is not, um, is not an easy task. and so. What they, were, what they were tasked to do was to really think about the regular project management. How do you enroll students and get them there on a regular daily basis? How do you raise the funds and resources to run the program? How do you design and manipulate the curriculum over time? Uh, how do you build sustainability for the, for the students who are running the program on a daily basis? I think that's part where we may have to work on a little bit because at the days were probably 18 plus hour days for all of you. So I think providing some support, logistical support, uh, intellectual support from uh, a well-trained um, and experienced educator would be a great benefit and probably make the project all the more sustainable. And as I mentioned, I think again, due 
in part uh, to the natural proclivities of the teachers that we work with, but also the work that we've done with them prior. We would probably have no shortage of folks who would be really enthusiastic about um, bringing what they know about uh, running schools and designing curriculum and effective management and instructional strategies uh, and incorporating that in sort of non-traditional educational opportunities. I think we would have a, a wealth of resources to draw from and hopefully that would prove to be an enhancement to the project. Great, and I know that you have about 35 PhD students and maybe 10 times that many master's students, right? So we're also thinking in terms of a longer vision. If, if this program continues, there may be some theses, some dissertations involved with incorporating that garden curriculum down the road. I know that Hannah got approached by a teacher asking for help with the curriculum when they come out to the Full Circle Farm Garden. Although Ashley already does lots of that, so I'm not sure why they called you, but they can, you could probably turn them to Ashley first. But it would be exciting for you to work on something like that, right? So uh, looks like for your graduate students, this, this relationship, a long-term relationship, could provide multiple opportunities in the future. Thumbs I think up we're that. always looking for bright and talented students with creative ideas. I think there's, um, there's a small but maybe powerful number of us in the School of Education who are interested in uh, the range of issues that would potentially be addressed through this piece of work, and we're always excited about that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I want to pass the baton to Ashley, because we approached you and said, hey, you've got this summer camp. Uh, last year you had two weeks. Uh, you had chirping chickadees and high-flying hawks. And they were younger age categories. And uh, we approached you and said, you know, what kind of gap is there? Is another group you'd like to address? And don't let me put words in your mouth, but I, th I think you said, sure, let's try 11 to 14 year olds and see what that could be. And did you ever imagine it would be either that much work or that much success? Or how about your feedback on how this was when these four students started showing up on a daily basis? So it was, um we were expecting to have at least two weeks of camp, and we ended up having five weeks of camp with the addition of the three weeks that we had with the 11 to 14 year olds. And it was phenomenal. We got to add another portion to it that the little kids are now able to, because the chirping chickadees are five to seven year olds, and the high flying hawks are eight to 10 year olds. And now they have something else they can look forward to because we don't have cooking in the first two camps, and we had so much cooking in the last one that. Uh, a lot of the kids were aspiring to come back just so they could participate and actually do the cooking, which is pretty exciting to actually get that next level of being involved with the food, not just eating it raw and creating salads and, and things that were only raw, but actually getting to prepare and do a lot more preparation with it and have that empowerment that the students were talking about um, where they get to actually prepare. So that was really exciting to add that portion onto it. So the, the really exciting part about this next year, too, is to be able to um, be influenced. So we only have one week of each, and the, the camp that they did was the same camp three times in a row so we could collect data for it. And what we're hoping for is this next year we could actually create two weeks for all of the camps so that if kids want to come for more than one week, it will be building and they'll actually be adding more, and then we can also do more data collection with the younger kids as well as the older kids. So there's a lot that we can um, add to those summer camps with just by looking at what we did this last year and really growing on it. So there's a lot of potential. So it's exciting. And Ken, maybe you, so I don't want to paint too rosy a picture here. There, there are some challenges too. And in fact, I want to own up to one of my own issues. So you should have seen last year when Ira attended this, uh, yes, disorganized meeting that I led. Uh, in January, after Food Summit 1, we said, who wants to show up for child nutrition? And we'll try to come up with the next round of ideas. And I invited all these people about doing community-based participatory research. And two days before we held the meeting, I thought, oh, I didn't invite Full Circle Farm. Oh, no. And I called them up, and Ashley and Wolfram and I can't remember, somebody else showed up, two or three of you. Anyway, I'm a horrible CBPR-er so far, OK? But I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn my lesson. But we descended on you. Did we, weren't there times when it was a burden and it was an extra challenge and these four students were coming up and you had your harvest festival to run and, right? It's not all easy. Oh no, it's not all easy, but I think the whole process was learning for everyone. So it was a very educational experience for everyone because they were trying to figure out how to not only collect data, manage kids, run a program. I was figuring out how much support they needed 
how much I should be involved, how much my staff should be involved, and also trying to run the other programs that we were doing. And so trying to figure out that balance. We had uh, the campers, and we were trying to figure out exactly what they, we wanted to get into their little brains, and also for them to get out of it and to be able to continue on with when they went home. So every, every piece of it was a learning experience, which learning is always challenging as well as rewarding. <laughs> Now let me put you on the spot here, because if, if I'd shown up the first day of camp mm -hmm. and said, hi, Education Director Ashley Pfeffer, I have brought my own Education Director provided by Ira Litt, and we're running a program. You would have been upset, I would imagine, and yet the first thing you asked for at the end of camp was, could you get Ira here, and could we talk about having an added Education Director next year? Right? I mean, in the, in the beginning, mm -hmm. did you think we needed one? We, we were actually, so when, at the very beginning, we have AmeriCorps as part of our program, a health, um, a health corps, and similar to Peace Corps, but, um, but not here in America. And we have, um, I had two full-time AmeriCorps students that were, or members that were working with me. And one of their jobs or projects was actually working on this summer camp for the younger kids, for the five to seven and the eight to 10 year olds. So when we first started on this embarkment of creating more summer camps, I definitely didn't want to take a project away from one of my AmeriCorps uh, mm. staff. Instead, I, I really wanted to be able to add to it and uh, allow the Stanford students to run with it, but at the same time, really um, cultivate and allow the AmeriCorps staff that I had already to be able to, to work with what she had already created, <laughs> not throw it away. So. But, but then Gina used up all her hours. <laughs> And the last couple weeks of camp were a little bit of a struggle as the students realized, oh my gosh, I think we're on mostly our own, right? And <laughs> Daniel got hurt. He had this huge gash on his leg and he had to leave camp a couple times. Anyway, yeah. it worked out. Next year, we'll get some help. Okay, to move from the education director to the executive director. So Wolfram Alderson has been doing this for 30 years. Uh, he was at Collective Roots prior to being at Full Circle Farm. And... Uh, He's now the fourth director of Full Circle Farm, and it's been there for four years, which reflects pretty high turnover, because this is a challenging place to be, to run an 11-acre organic farm on the grounds of a middle school. If we haven't said that before, it's on the grounds of Peterson Middle School. And I find what's most interesting is this an education and production farm. And a term that you used is this is hyper-intensive urban agriculture. Woo! Can you let me know what that is? And, and and put this in perspective, and then Juan, you're gonna, I'm, you're getting ready? Okay, I'm ready. sorry, I'm sorry to save you to the last there. Sure, well, uh, urban agriculture is fundamentally different than rural agriculture. Most of us, when we think about uh, farming, we think about, you know, a maybe archetypal image of uh, somebody riding around on a tractor somewhere in Iowa and big open fields, and um, we have a very different scenario in Silicon Valley. We're sitting on a piece of land that's worth uh, probably uh, 26 million dollars somewhere in that area which would be about a thousand times uh, more expensive per acre than the typical piece of farmland in California which is about twenty six hundred dollars an acre so you know we do have a responsibility to use systems on that land that maximize its potential not only in terms of productivity but what we're offering to the surrounding community and the student population uh, the land is uh, owned by the Santa Clara Unified School District and so hyper-intensive urban agriculture is a set of approaches that are really very different than in rural areas. For example, we have to rely on uh, different sources of fertility. We use wood chips, uh, which we have uh, uh, access to in large quantities. We don't have access to manure or other sources of fertility that farmers might have in rural areas. So we have to be uh, innovative and look at how we can maximize the, the impact of our work, our productivity, as well as the education side through uh, developing practices that are very intensive, but uh, also friendly to the land and sustainable. And so that's, a, that's a, a special challenge, because oftentimes people talk about intensive agriculture, they're talking about uh, lots of machinery and chemical fertilizers and so on, whereas we rely mostly on human power and um, biology to drive our farm. And so I've heard from your predecessor, Rebecca, that at times Full Circle Farm is only solvent until the next donation comes in. So these four years, trying to run an 11-acre organic farm and staff it. So you've got CSA members? We have a variety of sources of income. We have uh, 
a, a CSA, which supports up to 100 members any particular season. We have a farm stand and a growing slice of revenue coming from selling to local restaurants. But the reality is that um, there is no established funding stream for this area of work, whether it's garden-based learning or urban agriculture. And so we're constantly looking in different directions to uh, find those funding streams, and at the same time, uh, focusing on how to boost our capacity as an urban farm. So we're fortunate. Recently, we received a, a large uh, capacity building infrastructure grant from NVIDIA Corporation, which will help us invest in various uh, components of the farm, which will boost our productivity and ultimately get our earned income uh, from farm sales up over 50%, which is one of our uh, medium range goals. Yeah, and so, independent. so just to blow their horn a little bit, they gave you a quarter of a million dollars, and in December, as I understand it, a thousand employees will descend on the farm where a bunch of supervisors will be prepared to build an outdoor kitchen, a vegetable processing area. The current farm stand of tent poles and tarps will be replaced with a real farm stand. There'll be a better storage capacity. All, did I get all that right? Yes. And this is really, even though this is a, a very special moment for us, the farm has essentially been built uh, very much in this style. Various corporate and community groups coming forward and sponsoring uh, pieces of the farm. Everything you see on the farm, which was essentially an athletic field four years ago, uh, was built through community efforts. And oftentimes corporate groups come in not only with being able to write a check, but being able to contribute volunteers and engage. And so I think one of the themes that you've been emphasizing is long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're essentially built on at the farm, even though we're only four years old. We're all about building those relationships. Most of our corporate partners come back uh, over and over again, and employees are uh, literally dying for opportunities to uh, get, get away from their computers and get involved in the food system and, and do some great work on the farm. So it could be a tipping point here. This is a big deal, this latest grant. Yeah, I like to think the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> okay. Uh, because this is, uh, this is long-term work. Uh, you know, in my briefcase, I have a first edition of Food First that I picked up 30-something uh, <laughs> years ago. And um, I, at the time, I was standing on the shoulders of giants and w Full Circle Farm, it's the same scenario. Uh, it is heavy lifting and we, we have had a few directors and, and many staff, but it's a community effort. I think the whole point is it takes uh, a lot of us working together to change the food system. And uh, it's not just gonna, this change isn't just gonna be handed to us on a silver platter. We really have to work for it at the end of a hoe and um, writing grants and uh, all different kinds of ways. All right, thanks. And now I want to make it a little more provocative. So, Full Circle Farm is there by the grace of the Santa Clara Unified School District. It is on the grounds of Peterson Middle School. And you're producing, I don't know what the number is, 100,000 pounds a year yet of organic produce, or that's the goal? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next speaker is Juan Cordon. He's the food service director of the entire Santa Clara Unified School District. And you would think with the food right there on the middle school grounds, what a mecca this would be for those middle school students. And from an educational perspective, it absolutely is. The sixth and seventh grade teachers bring their kids out there, and, and maybe the eighth, are we up to the eighth grade yet? Not, Not quite to the eighth. <laughs> so when Juan found out about the farm, he was told, yeah, you know, they're gonna give you some great produce, and it's gonna be local and sustainable, and uh, 100,000 pounds of organic produce, most of which is grown in the summer when school's out. And so if you divided that, whatever's remaining in the fall and the, the spring, among your, how many thousand students, Juan? 17,000. 17,000 who have to eat for 180 days. So uh, I want to throw a little, I want to provoke this a little and throw something into the mix here. How hard is it to have a farm on the grounds? You know, I think it's great. I mean, it sounds good in theory, at least from my perspective, which is only the food service side on what we feed the kids for breakfast and lunch. So far, it hasn't worked as well as we would have liked it to work. About five years ago, when the, when the idea was presented to, to me, they said, okay, in a couple of years or at some point, you know, you'll be um, able to use 50% of the production coming from the farms. And then what we'll do is we'll serve it throughout our school districts. Kids will come to the farm. They'll see what we grow. Then you'll serve it to them in different ways and so it was really neat it sounded like a great idea and um, we did have a couple months of success but not not any long-term success and um, you know I know there was a lot of turnover at the farm 
and probably there was those couple months where, where I was rather difficult and it's like, well, we can't use what you're giving us. I don't, the stuff you're giving me is too ripe. What are we gonna do with it? Um, and so those are the struggles we have all the time. But I know the, the long-term goal or the, the immediate goal of the school district is to continue to somehow um, try to work with the farm so that we can get these, um, these fresh fruits and produce to the, school, to the ch child's plate during lunch. Um, we do have chefs on staff. We have two chefs on staff in, in our district. So at some point, at least I'm not a chef. So when you were gonna give me a Swiss chard or kale, what am I gonna do, to, to, what, what am I gonna do with it? How am I gonna serve it to kids? Um, well, we brought in people who were trained to do those things. And at some point they did implement it into our salad bars. And it, and it was neat, the kids were eating it, some kids chose it, some kids didn't. But um, we didn't have it on a consistent basis where we, we were able to possibly change the eating habits of the kids. And so when I hear all the success stories that we're having with these summer camps, it's really neat. I, you know, hopefully we can be part of it um, on a daily basis you know, during the school year. Well, and part of the reason I invited Juan is he was here last year for the Food Summit and he sat in at the Child Nutrition Group. And what I, I love about Juan is what a straight shooter is. We came up with some idealistic ideas last year, and we'd look over at him and he'd say, not in my neighborhood. Yeah, that's not going to work. I've got to feed these students. I've got to know where the source is. It's got to be reliable. I'm working with 20 different farms. Uh, you know, that's not going to work for me. Okay, what's next? Very open-minded, very positive and progressive, but you have to feed 17,000 kids a day for 180 days. I mean, so how many full-circle farms... Would it take you to get all the produce? You know, that it's you not needed? how many would it take. We'll, we'll take whatever they give us. And that's uh -huh. where we were. Probably about a year and a half, I'm like, what do you have? And they'd say, we have this, this, and this. Will you take it? Yeah, we'll take all of it. And that, we were doing that for probably about four straight months. And whatever they had, we'd say, we'll take whatever. What are you going to make with it? I don't know. We're going to ask the chef, and he'll come up with something. And so that's, that, we got to that point, and then it kind of just faded out, and we had some transition, and it, and it hasn't really come back. And so my hope is, is that we can hopefully start this sooner than later. Um, I think another problem that came to it were, were the economics of it. Um, it was never determined really what, what, the, what, the pri what, what price they were going to sell the produce to us at. Um, people assumed they were going to give it to us and well we had to buy it. And a lot of times they were offering me the produce and it was more expensive than what I can go to, to the market and buy it at. And so th that became a challenge. Because I had at one point, I had the school district, the, the school board saying, we want you to buy from the farm. I go, what's well, going to cost me more than if I go buy it from the produce company? Right. What would you like me to do? And you hate to say, but when we talk about child nutrition, there are the economics of it. It's just, you know, we're asking to do more with less. And so that has to be part of the equation. And, um, the, you know, but I guess <laughs> if you look at one benefit, they weren't offering us that many cases. So it didn't have that kind of financial impact. But I think once they get into full production, we are going to have to decide what, what is a fair price for it and, and what, is, what can the school district afford. But Wilfram, if you had to offer this food under cost or free, half of what you produced, and run an education component, boy, you're stuck with a lot of donations then to make up for that income. Exactly. I mean, we, we are working in uh, a, a paradox, if you will. I mean, in order for a nonprofit community farm to survive, we have to look for the highest return on our uh, produce. And uh, oftentimes that's that our, uh, our CSA members are, are paying uh, a, a premium price, farm stand, uh, restaurant sales in particular, looking for kind of gourmet produce items. And then school districts are looking for food sort of at that minimum uh, cost. And uh, we essentially l lose money when we sell at uh, you know, the, the lowest wholesale rate. So, it, there is a, a challenge there, um, and it, it's definitely um, something that we haven't figured out. We're trying to figure it out as we go along. You know, in fact, we wrote a grant with uh, Jay Bhattacharya to apply to USDA. In fact, it's going to be scored this month. We'll see if we get it or not. But he did some economic projections, and as I watched him put all his little Greek letters together, he said, okay, well, to make this thing work and to give food to the school, you're going to have to factor in the donations that you get and the volunteer work that you get, and, and without that, it wouldn't fly at all. But that's a part of Full Circle Farm, is the volunteer work, the community outreach. And our, our farm bears the, the cost of providing education. I mean, uh, people like Ashley uh, come at a, a price, and 
uh, we, we think that that's part of our, our formula for how we, how we build a community farm. The education is a key component. But other farmers don't have to worry about that. That's not a cost for them. Uh, we host, uh, you know, every week, uh, sometimes every day, we have visitors, tour groups, uh, presentations, workshops, uh, special programs that we create. And that takes a lot of staff time and investment. Uh, and we think that's part of the formula, as part of being a part of the, the school district. So I think when we do the equations about uh, produce sales, uh, I think we have to look at you know, the larger picture, which is we're not just about producing uh, fruits and vegetables. We're about uh, producing uh, uh, bright minds, producing educational experiences, engaging the general public. So there's, there's a, a few other bottom lines that we're looking at at the farm besides just produce sales. Okay. I'd love to open this up to the audience. Uh, this seems incredibly unique, an 11-acre organic education and production farm on the grounds of a middle school in the middle of Silicon Valley. Do any of you have some questions of this fascinating interdisciplinary panel? Uh, I thought that we had stands with microphones, but we don't. So do we have a microphone that we're going to walk around, or does anybody? Oh, Antonella, if you've got a question, Antonella's got a mic right there. Antonella, there's somebody behind you that way. Yeah, oh good, you got two, so hand out one in advance. Can you please state your name, what organization you're with, and then your question. Thanks. Um, Carol Peckler, retired uh, faculty member from the College of Education, San Jose State. I placed student teachers at Pe Peterson Middle School because it was such a special place, and I learned from the founder of that garden that it was very difficult to maintain that property all of those years. I wonder how it could be possible for any other school to do such a thing. Well, I'll, take a, I'll take a try. Um, everything we do at Full Circle Farm is uh, scalable and replicable, as they say, uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, we, we operate at a scale of 11 acres, but Every component we have at the farm, whether it's a community orchard, uh, a community garden, an education garden, uh, production fields, uh, greenhouse structure, farm stand, all of those can be scaled and have been. I mean, there really isn't an original idea at Full Circle Farm. I think what's unique about it is that we have so many great ideas in one place. Um, and I've, I've worked for a number of years in the field of garden-based learning and implementing uh, garden projects in schools, so this is very much something that can be replicated in other school districts. But it does require buy-in, uh, really, at the school district level, uh, certainly at the leadership level at the local schools, and uh, it takes a community to raise a farm. Urban agriculture, for the most part, is uh, illegal in most cities. And so it takes the whole community to focus on this as a priority, just like we think it's necessary to have parks and play fields for children, uh, we have to make a decision as, as a society that um, these are the, this is something that we want to have as a part of our community landscape. Any other panelists want to jump in? I just in? want to add, add one, one other thought, which is that I, I think we can think in a wide range of scales. So um, our student teachers and our graduates are in a wide range of uh, school settings. and. Um, Many of those settings uh, have at least the, the start uh, of a, a productive uh, school garden, and that can be from a multi-acre plot, a quarter-acre plot, or one pot. And part of what I think is important is that we're providing young children with an opportunity to think deeply and carefully about where they get their food, uh, where it comes from, how it's produced, what that means for them, the connection between food and health, um, exposing them to opportunities to prepare and eat high-quality, uh, nutrient-rich food, and that can happen whether your plot is 11 acres or really 11 small canisters in your classroom, or even one where you're growing something so they can see the production side, and then you can supplement it by purchasing food from a CSA or from a um, you know, local farmer's market. So there's a wide range of ways to think about uh, schools' opportunities to do this kind of work with young children. Let me add just two quickies. I know that when I first became introduced to it, I said, how did this come about? And the community actually had up for grabs for a vote. Soccer complex, condominiums, or 11-acre organic farm. And the community voted for the 11-acre organic farm. And when we submitted our USDA grant, wondering if this could be replicated anywhere else, um, Peterson Middle School was a high school that got downsized to a middle school, which is why they had all those 
underutilized athletic fields. And we, Antonella called 30 school districts or something like that before we submitted our grant. And a quarter of them within the district had a high school that had been downsized to a middle school that had those underutilized fields. Another question. Yeah, um, my name's Judy and I'm from Gilroy. We started a Gilroy demonstration garden last year. And the goal is to have it be an education piece for the schools and to have a garden in every school. And I guess my question too is the support that you have from your school district, is there any funding through the school district or are you out always trying to find grants? Because it's kind of hard to do the, we only have three quarters of an acre and we have some school tours that come to our garden. But you know, our desire is to have a garden in each of these schools and also to have the food go to the kids in the schools. Um, but it's kind of hard, you're trying to run the garden at the same time, trying to find the funding and kind of how do you do it? I'm happy to take a stab at that one too. Um, yes, I mean, it's extremely difficult to ask school districts right now for funding and it has been for many years. One thing I'll say is I'm extremely grateful to Delane Easton who, when she was uh, state superintendent of our school system, stated that we need to have a garden in every school. Um, that came with uh, very few dollars from the state or through other education systems, but at least it was placed as a priority um, within the school systems. Uh, we look for our funding from uh, so many different sources and we're really at Full Circle Farm adopting uh, an entrepreneurial model uh, in, in some ways trying to um, act like many of our associates on the for-profit side in Silicon Valley and looking at how we can um, be entrepreneurial in terms of the products that we grow on the farm and there are some great examples of, of this around the country uh, in Southern California have uh, food from the hood uh, high school Crenshaw High School developed their own salad dressing product and so we're looking at ways to increase our revenue uh, significantly from earned income uh, from products and services and then uh, we're constantly looking for grants that are in alignment with our mission um, and there's many challenges there which I'd be happy to talk to you about afterwards uh, but it does require a lot of creativity and a lot of support from different directions. A huge slice of our uh, support is in kind, which doesn't really show up on the bottom line of our budget, but uh, literally tens of thousands of dollars a year come in through uh, projects and pieces of the farm that are sponsored by uh, local corporations and community groups. So what I'm saying is it takes really a, a shotgun approach to getting uh, funding, uh, meaning looking in all directions and, and sometimes holding a shotgun <laughs> Uh, because we, we are uh, constantly uh, looking for the funds and it is a, a very much a challenge. Um, our partnerships, I think if there is a, a kind of a, a, a big picture strategy for looking for resources, it's partnership and collaboration. And this long-term relationship with Stanford, um, this, this, this is not a, a new thing with the Food Summit. Stanford's been supporting work in East Palo Alto with Collective Roots and I'm sure with other groups as well. And so these kinds of relationships are essential to keep us going. And um, we just need to keep looking in all directions. There's, there's quite a few different um, schools that we've been working with, even though Scott is school district as a, on a district level, that have been wanting that for their district as well and their schools. And they've been doing a lot of the same brainstorming that you sound like you've been doing, trying to figure out where those resources are and making sure that they're getting buy-in from the people as far up as possible so that they're getting any little tidbits of um, support and finances and, and funding. So it's happening everywhere. But the cool thing is that because it's happening and because it's kind of on the forefront, there, there is money out there and there are potentials. It's just a matter of finding it and really accessing it for more, more than just one year. Does somebody else have the next mic? We've got pride. Yep, please stand up. Whoever has the next one. I see somebody with a mic. Hi, my name is Janie Heinrich, and I'm a nutrition counselor. And I was just going to say that it's beautiful what you guys are doing. I'm wondering, do you have a cooking class that you offer to the students? So maybe three of the classes can be cooking and pickling and doing things that they can sell to the community. Maybe not all the students can partake in it in the foods of the farm but at least they can partake in the dirt and the seeds and the growing and that energy. So uh, currently what we do is we have uh, classes with all of the sixth grade. They come regularly to the farm throughout the whole year. So they get, actually have a plot 
that they get to garden in and they learn about food systems and nutrition. And so they get the whole gamut as a sixth grader. And then the seventh grade classes are a lot more focused on their science curriculum. So we go directly with the science teachers and their um, standard based curriculum. So that's a lot more like chromatography, a little bit broader than just nutrition and food systems because that's what we have to do with the schools. And then what we're hoping to do more with is Peterson actually has an amazing program with culinary arts and they're uh, creating, they're building a new kitchen actually on their campus, which is phenomenal. For and teaching. For, yeah, for, for their classes, for, for their culinary arts classes. And so they're able to do a lot of that stuff and we're hoping to bring them out. And I've been working with that teacher a little bit to, to create those classes more with the seventh and eighth grade students that are part of that culinary arts class. And we are, um, with the NVIDIA grant, we're starting to build out our kitchen on the farm, our outdoor kitchen. So Stanford, <laughs> the Stanford students, when they came for, the, for that summer camp, they were able to provide a lot of resources and to start that outdoor kitchen, which uh, looked like tables and cutting boards and knives, <laughs> which we didn't have any of that stuff before they came this summer. So we are, have already started some of that kitchen. And then uh, when NVIDIA comes in December, we'll actually have some walls and maybe even a stove. <laughs> so there's, it's a progression, but right now what we try to do is, um, in the future, what we're hoping as we build on our capacity and what we have available to be able to teach these classes, we're hoping to be able to offer more um, cooking classes to adults and also to the students. So. Uh, whether it be summer camp or just a cooking class weekly, like an after-school program, there's uh, a lot of different opportunities for that. I'll just chime in on that. We, we built the cornerstone for our kitchen, which is a cob oven, mm -hmm. uh, and that was built with funds from Kaiser Permanente. We have a Kaiser pediatrician on our board, and we have uh, classes coming over from Kaiser um, that are dealing with obesity. And so that's already a huge success. It's uh, just, just the oven piece has become tremendously popular and uh, produces great food and uh, we can really see the potential and, and we're getting very excited about building our full-scale kitchen in December. Can I, Ira. I just want to uh, continue to underscore maybe the theme of uh, simplicity. So um, I mean all of these uh, resources and opportunities are terrific if you can have access to them but uh, part of the work that we do with our um, teacher candidates I mean, we do have the great luxury of getting to cook in uh, Jesse's kitchen with them several times a year, but really the focus of the work is having them think about translating the work that we do with one pot, a hot plate, and a wooden spoon, and uh, 10 simple ingredients. And everything that we prepare, even though we get to do it with the, you know, in the beautiful surround and with the love of Jesse's kitchen, all of that can be done with one pot and a hot plate uh, and an electrical outlet. So, uh, and if you didn't even have that, you could do some of the preparations and you know, cook your pasta at home and bring it into the school. So it's quite possible to cook with a large number of students in a wide range of places um, without all of the you know, complicated uh, tools and equipment and surroundings. And I think that's really an important message because otherwise it makes it seem unachievable. Julia, something? Well, just a, a quick plug for the educators in the room also are those who are looking for partnerships that I think this is this is where um, as for example I know Matt has sent a couple of students to me Matt Roth who um, had this idea about moving all the way from from seed to farm to production to cooking and and working with students on that and a couple of really energetic students are going to take this on as yet another student initiated course this year there's a lot of opportunity driven by students at the university level at a lot of, of universities in the area. There's, there's, there's fuel out there for thinking about creative ways mm -hmm. to add to partnerships and to grow that circle of concern, to grow the number of people who are engaged in this process, who want to volunteer, who want to lead that next class. Who, so, so whether it is through the School of Education or whether it is through community-based research, service learning classes, that, that, that interest, that enthusiasm is out there. I think a lot of it is just finding the right partners and building those partners. And, and whether it is you know, pickling programs and finding ways to connect that in a fun way with, with nutrition or, or something else, there are opportunities out there. It's just linking them together. Now, that's a perfect way for me to end, except Willie has a microphone and I can't deny Willie, William Reed, the chance to ask his question. But this will be the last question before our break. Thank you. Um, I'm a farmer. I've been for over 25 years, organic farmer. And um, I would like to just 
ask if what if every garden if there's a garden in every school there needs to be a farmer in every garden mm -hmm. so what are you guys doing in your programs to increase the, the number of farmers with less than 2% of our population currently farming and the average age of the farmer 56 years old. This seems like a really great opportunity to couple the farmer with the educators and the younger people. So that's my question. Julie wants it. Maybe, maybe we should just go down the line on that one. So I'll, okay. I'll say from a, from a Stanford point of view, I'm gonna do a shout out to Patrick Archie and the School of Earth Sciences, the farm. <laughs> Stanford Farm is a farm. We do have a farm on campus. We have plenty of students who run through classes that our farm educator uh, runs back there. So they're, at Stanford, we have the ability to think either at the scale of food production and, and very local food, uh, as well as what Christopher mentioned, to think across scales of agriculture internationally and the connections between environment, climate change, poverty, hunger, et cetera. So, but a key piece of this is developing, um, I hope, even a larger farm into the future on Stanford lands, and Patrick will sit at the, the center of that. So those of you who are interested in issues of food production right here on campus, you'll want to talk to Matt because he's dealing with it on the food end, and you'll definitely want to talk with Patrick, who's way in the back, because he's, he's worked with some of these AmeriCorps programs, started AmeriCorps programs. We, we uh, very gracefully stole him away from Santa Clara, and I'm really delighted to have him. Okay, quick answers for anybody else. I'm abusing my time here. Well, we start with the, the littler ones and middle school, just being able to raise them up and teach them what it is to grow. So just starting to spark that fire of, of what it is to be a farmer and then also um, cultivating our AmeriCorps who are uh, a lot of them wanting to be farmers or are in the beginning stages of being farmers, whether they're educators or are more on the farming side. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say I think a, a big part of it is creating context. It's just so important that young people have the experience of going to a farm and participating in farming and gardening activities. Um, the farm here at, at Stanford at the sort of the college level, um, the literally hundreds of uh, garden-based programs throughout um, the Bay Area and around the country. Um, you just have to be at the farm to kind of get what that is about and see pre groups of preschoolers coming in for the first time, seeing real live chickens and understanding that's where eggs come from, uh, to, to the farm camp and, and seeing kids, when you talk about making lunch, that they turn around and go out into the garden and actually harvest that food and bring it from the garden to the table. That context is so impactful. And so I think that's where you know, becoming a farmer begins, is having some sort of impactful experience early in life. And we've just got to carve that out in our, in our community landscape, in our schools, and all the way up to our colleges. And, and that's what it's about. All right, thanks. I'm just going to finish with a couple of slides. I hope my co-collaborators aren't mad at me for going over time here. So if I can have my slides back up. One person we didn't have on the panel was Jay Mitchell, who's from the law school, who's been working with this group. And I think what that really gets at is, here's Ashley and Wolfram. I'm from the School of Medicine. Tim and Hannah came from Humanities and Sciences, Ira's Education, Julie's Earth Sciences, Jay is Law School. Uh, I just put an ad out to engineering. Uh, Dan Haifman wants a chipper. So I've got some money for a, an engineer to design a mid-range chipper for them. And uh, Michelle, if you're here, I think they need some help with their business plan. So if we could get the business school to chime in. And for the Haas Center, thank you very much for donating that uh, summer scholarship. I mean, it's incredible. So these folks have touched on, or potentially will, all seven schools of campus. And uh, thank you very much for all of you, including Juan, to, to mix it up a little for us tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.